Alrighty, good morning, church family. It is a great day to be in the Lord's house this morning. If you have your Bible, um, go ahead and open up to Psalm 150. That's what we'll be reading at today. Give you all a couple minutes, a couple seconds, not minutes. <laughs> all right, Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Let's all stand and let's worship together. <laughs> Greek. 
captain and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifting high oh god you have done great things he's been faithful through every storm you've been faithful through every storm and you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and we know this church and i know you will do it again for your promise is yes and amen you will do great things god you do great things he's hero oh hero of heaven you conquer the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things hallelujah god above it all hallelujah god unshakable hallelujah you have done great things hallelujah god above it all hallelujah god unshakable hallelujah you have done great things you've done great things Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. done great things oh god you do great things Amen. i'm gonna read a scripture to you this morning before Kevin does prayer. This is from Psalms 118:28. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, and I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. So let's always praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all very much this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Glad to see everybody out today. Beautiful Sunday morning. If you're visiting, glad to have you. If you're a regular, we're glad you came. Uh, just a couple announcements this morning. Today is the last day for Forget the Frock shirts. They will be ordered at the end of service, so please, if you want a shirt, sign up. Let Brother Kyle know. Uh, there is a 5.30 meeting for Women of Joy. I'm assuming that's still on. All right. And uh, Sunday evening, 6 o'clock, going over Galatians. Does anybody have anything? Any announcements or anything? I got your women's Bible study sign-up sheet. Women's Bible study sign-up sheet in the back. Amen. Anything else? If not, once again, glad to have you, and I will do offertory prayer. Uh, Father God, we come to you just thanking you for this day you've given us, Lord, the beautiful sunshine outside, and just uh, the ability to come and praise you freely, Lord. Just what a wonderful gift that is. Uh, we do lift up Brother Kyle to you, Lord, and just ask you hide him behind the cross and uh, give him the words, Lord, that uh, you need our ears to hear and let us uh, just absorb it all in, Lord. Uh, Father God, uh, 
We lift up all those on the prayer concern list, and we thank you for all your many praises. Uh, we do ask you to take these tithes and offerings and help them to further your word. Father God, we thank you, and we love you, and we ask all of your son in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. continue in worship. Let's all stand together. my heart, Lord. 
Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Just think of this amazing grace, church. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. And how precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Our chains are gone, church. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. promise good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion me as long as life endures my chains are gone I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, my chains are gone, I've been set my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever We're so thankful for you. We're thankful for your blood, your grace, your mercy, your peace, everything that you have for us. And we pray that that last verse is true, that we are forever yours, and you are forever ours. And we're so thankful for you. Be with us as we go through the rest of this service. So I pray. Amen. Amen. This time. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? 
got one more. Did you know I played this message? No, I didn't get in there. Hey, let me get out of the way. Good morning. Um, I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of nervous. I haven't done this in a while. Um, I'm going to be playing and singing a newer song. I guess it's a, about a year old now. Um, it's kind of slow. It's beautiful. Um, but the words are they're powerful. So I don't know if we have the words up there. Did we get them? No, okay. It's, I'll do my best to enunciate then. <laughs> it's called, um, Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. My hands are cold. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. But sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside so you paid the debt and paid the debt i owed broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i had hope thank you jesus for the blood applied thank you Jesus it has washed me white thank you Jesus you have saved my life you bought me from the darkness into glorious light place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death has no sting my life has no end for i have been transformed by the blood of the lamb thank you jesus for the blood applied thank you jesus it has washed me wide thank you jesus you have saved my life brought me from the darkness into glorious life there is nothing stronger than the the sons and daughters we are ransomed by your father through the blood there is nothing stronger than the wonder working power of the blood the blood that calls the sons and daughters we are blood applied and thank you Jesus it has washed me wide thank you Jesus you have saved my life brought me from the 
darkness into glorious light. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Definitely, definitely grateful this morning for all that's helped, right? Uh, with Miss Jean and Kevin and Sarah Joe leading us this morning. Uh, definitely wonderful words, right? As we're gathering together to definitely praise the Lord, right? It is good to see every single one of you out this morning. I know that we've got a jam-packed uh, yeah, today is a today is a loaded service, right? And I've got a loaded day. I'm already triple booked for this afternoon, so I'm trying to figure figure out how I'm going to make everything work. So definitely pray for that as well. Uh, but uh, man, it is good um, good to be here with you all today. I know that uh, there's lots going on, so please make sure you're paying close attention to that bulletin um, as. Um, it will keep you updated um, the best that we possibly can. I know the weather's turning pretty, right? Praise the Lord for that. Uh, sun is out and about today. And, you know, even as I, I began and praying through this week, right, uh, prettier weather means uh, kids definitely want to be outside more and more, especially up here on this hill. And as I, I think about the dangers that set up here on this hill, right, so just just bear with me here for a moment, just knowing that everything towards this way right is towards the highway and uh, we know that man 150 is a brutal road uh, we know that uh, there's no rest there it constantly keeps going and we know right kids constantly going outside and we know that they're playing we know we've got swing sets and basketball but just think for just a quick moment how far off that hill would we allow our kids to get before we start trying to get their attention do we wait till they get to the tall grass and then start trickling down the hill before we say all right far enough do we let them get three quarters or halfway down the hill so to speak and and getting closer and closer to the road before we start saying all right it's far enough come come on back up the hill you see, there's tons of balls that seems to always end up over there, and uh, it's, uh, it, it can be a, a, a trap for balls, right? They do not last very long once they go off that hill, but just think about little children as they're on that playground, and we know that they don't like to stay. How far would we allow them to get before we say, all right, enough? Would we let them get to the guardrail before we start yelling and saying, hey, wait a minute kids come back it's too far I think that we would begin to start speaking with a loud voice so to speak especially the closer and closer that they get to that road why why is that there's just danger there on that road it's an example that I know that we've used countless times, but it's something so very real for us to grab a hold of because we know if they get on that road, a car may not see them. They could be ran over, right? That something terrible could happen once they get down there. We wouldn't say, all right, kids, come on back up the hill. We would be screaming at the top of our lungs if a kid makes it to the guardrail or makes it to the shoulder down there. We don't want them to get out in that road. 
And today we're, we're carrying on with this series, and I know, right, some of you may be already over this series on do you need a biblical church, but I'm praying, right, I'm praying that today that you would, would press in just a little bit, a little bit closer, because today, right, is week number six, so to speak, and we're talking about biblical accountability and discipline. And I know, I've already told, I've already told the wife and the deacons, I said, today is rough. Today is rough, right? Today in my quiet time, it was like, Lord, can we go somewhere else besides this passage today? And I mentioned this last week, right? Because things can be sensitive, right? And it can definitely, in the world we're living in, be politically incorrect to talk about the things that we're going to talk about today. And when I say that, right, I, I want you to mean that everything we're about to see in God's word, everything that we're going to look at in this book, right, goes against the grain of what we're seeing, of what we're taught, the way that we're almost actually wired to live in this world. We live in a world where it's so offensive to say that someone's particular belief is wrong. Right? It's even more offensive to tell someone that they're, what they're doing is wrong. Right After all, we start hearing people say, whether it's Christians or non-Christians alike, they'll begin to quote Jesus somehow miraculously, right? Didn't Jesus say, don't judge lest you be judged? Right? Who are you to point out something wrong in my life when you've got so much going on in your own life? How about minding your own business? We've actually convinced ourselves, church, that inside the church that it's loving, that it's almost kind, that it's almost the way that we should do. It's almost compassionate to sit back and say to one another, especially with someone else's sin in their life, that's their business, that's their responsibility. What someone else does behind closed doors or what someone else does is between them and the Lord. And I know that that may even sound super spiritual right on the surface, right? That it almost makes us feel good in the world that we're living in, right? But I want to show you that's anything but loving. And it's anything but loving according to God's word. It would be no different than us sitting there just whispering to our kids as they ex or get close to that road down there. It's something that we wouldn't do. It's something that we would just scream out as loud as we possibly could to stop them from getting on that road. And I want to look at a ton of passages this morning, so bear with me, right? We're going to be doing a lot of flipping. I encourage you, as we've been doing the last several weeks, jot down these verses. Go back. Unpack them for yourself. Don't take what I'm telling you today, especially my opinions, because they mean absolutely nothing. I want you to grab from the Word of God this morning. So we're going to be starting in Hebrews, and then we're going to be jumping to Matthew, and we're going to finish up in 1 Corinthians. So we're going around the block today. Let's go. Hebrews 12, verses 3 through 11 is what I want to just kind of start our time this morning as the writer of Hebrews is really talking so much about what's going to set the stage for us this morning. It says, Consider him who endeared from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons my son do not regard lightly the discipline of the lord nor be weary when reproved by him for the lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastises every son whom he receives it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and sons and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For the discipline, uh, for they discipline us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
oh my gracious, right? And I know uh, there's so much that I can't even, I can't even begin to talk about this passage, but I wanted you to see that entire text, right? So that we can see verse six is where I want to, want to grab a hold of, right? It makes it clear that God disciplines those whom he loves. Believe it or not, there's a false gospel that says that God doesn't discipline anyone. Listen to me, that's a lie from the pits of hell. That's not what the Word of God says. We just read it. Be glad that God has not left you alone. Be glad that He's not leaving you to wade through this muck and this mire, that you're not alone in the sin that so easily entraps you. Be glad that God doesn't say what we say. Well, that's your problem. You deal with it. That's not the heart of the gospel. It's not what, what, what God is telling us from cover to cover. In our sin, God comes running after us, and he says the greatest words. It's not good. Don't do it. Made a way for you to be forgiven. I've made a way for you to be free from it, to turn from it. Church, this is love. This is what a good father does. So I know, I know even as we say these words, how do, we, how do we express God's love to one another inside of the church to be this biblical church that we're talking about? Do we do this by being so lazy to one another's sin? Do we say that's your business? Doesn't really bother or hurt me or my family. Do what you want. Or do we lovingly confront one another in sin as it is our business? And I want, to, I want you to see another passage here really quickly, right? That I want you to show you what God's Word is really speaking, right? Just leaping off the pages of us today. Galatians 6.1, plugging for Galatians. We're going to be getting here on Sunday nights, but I'm telling you, man, come join us for as we uncover God's Word through the book of Galatians on Sunday nights. Starting chapter 6, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. This verse is one that I promise you, when I surrendered to the call of ministry, it was like God said, here is your bumper sticker. This is the shirt. This is the verse. This is what you need to make sure you understand. All of those people that it's so easy for us to look down upon, especially in the church today when we see so many godly men and women falling victim to sin in this world, and we say we could never do that. Newsflash, you can. It's so easy sin is so good right and the enemy is very good at what he's doing and God said Kyle you are so dumb you'll fall for the same tricks that you fell for your entire life keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted I want every word of this verse to to just almost soak into you this morning right God is speaking right through through the Apostle Paul here he speaks to these people this group here in Galatians just like their family he says, brothers, right? And just like we've looked at a few weeks ago about church membership and how God's brought us to be this local body here, right? We need to realize that we belong to one another here, that there's something wonderful just like it is for you and your blood family, for those of you who get along, right? We should be brothers and sisters in Christ he says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, right? The implication of this is the word caught. And I need you to understand that this word means so much more than just your little slip up of sin. This word caught is, is so much more in death, right? This means that this brother or sister is continuing in sin, that they're not turning from it, right? That they're not repenting of it, that they're not running from it, right? So this should be someone with an ongoing reality inside of their life, right? If you think about it, there is a sense in every, every one of us, right? Every week as we gather together to hear God's word as it's preached and as it's taught here, we should be experiencing some type, some form of church discipline. And the word of God is really encouraging us for a response every way in specific ways for us to turn from that. 
for us not to stay in it, for us to say, yes, God, we know that we've messed up and we want to now walk with you. We want to be holy like you. Church, we need to be a church that will love us enough to lead us away from sin and towards Jesus. And that is a loaded statement, right? And we're going to take the remainder of our time today just to unpack that statement because it is loaded. We need a church that will love us enough to lead us from sin and towards Jesus. Same thing with those kids. We, we need to love them enough not to let them play on that road. And I know that there's so many things that uh, a a, a church should be doing. And that's what we've been looking at, right? And this little part of what we're talking about is not just uh, one thing of many, right? There's, this is actually probably one of the most important things that a church must do. And if you'll go ahead and turn to Matthew 18, right? I want you to hear from Jesus himself, right? I want you to see it inside of the Bible, what we've talked about straight from his mouth. This is not myself or someone in leadership or a bunch of pastors of us getting together one day and saying, okay, I think that this would be a really cool topic to talk about on Sunday morning. Let's talk about church discipline, right? How about accountability, right? This will be the one that will make us all so very excited. No, we're talking about this very issue because God said it's important. And we looked at actually both of these verses at the very beginning, the very first Sunday that we started this series, right? We talked about Matthew 16, and this is exactly the first time that Jesus uses the word church. And in two chapters later, Matthew 18, right, this is where we're going to see the second time. Right, the first time he mentions it, he uses the word when he's talking about people who profess him as Lord. And then we're talking about church as this community of people who identifies Jesus as Lord. And then now we're seeing this word now being mentioned with with particular instructions. Read with me Matthew 18, verses 15 and 17. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Oh, my gracious, I know, I know these words, right, are so, so strong. And for for some of us, right, maybe the last verse is really, really tough for us, and we're going to unpack this. This whole passage right here in Matthew is about someone being restored, right? Being restored back to God. It's about church discipline, offering corrective care, right? When someone is unrepented, in sin, away from God. And I need you to need you to understand this, right? Biblical accountability and discipline is tough. They're not number 100 on the list of 101 things. Jesus says the church should do, it's actually at the top of the list, right? Right after we confess Jesus as Lord, we see him instructing the church on discipline and accountability. I know, right? I know inside of this room, I know it makes us feel uncomfortable, right? we, We begin to start thinking, oh my Lord, that even myself included, None of us are beyond getting to this point. And if you think that you are, then you're already fooling yourself. We've got to see how important this is. It's the reason why that the world thinks that Christianity is a joke. You see, we're we're actually no different than the world. And sin is so deceptive in our lives that we need people who are close enough to us to see us when we're stepping off this hill into the tall grass, getting closer to the road, that they will say, hey, wait a minute, whoa. That they'll say, stop, don't go any further. Do you know what's at stake? (laughs) Do you know what will happen if you get out in that road? Church, I need this. I'm not above this. 
And I tell you, by God's grace, I have people in my life who know my besetting sins. <laughs> Something that I, that I don't want to brag about this morning, right? The sins that I'm most prone to struggle with. I know I heard a pastor one time say that his wife was like the little Holy Spirit. Sometimes I feel mine is the same way. <laughs> she will call me to the corporate very quickly and doesn't have a problem doing that. But I have people outside of her. I have people that I value their opinion. And yes, when they tell me that I'm wrong, does it hurt my pride? Does it hurt my feelings? Yes. But guess what? It's good for me. And I have people who on a regular basis that I talk with, that I meet with, that I pray with, that we share accountability and discipline, that we go over things that maybe we wouldn't share with other people. And I want to encourage every single follower of Christ inside of here today, you need that. You need that in your life. If you do not have that, you're in a dangerous place spiritually. And as your pastor, right, I don't want you to be there. I don't want you to fall victim to sliding off this hill and getting ran over by the enemy. I know when the days come right, I want to, to hopefully help you, to encourage you, every follower of Christ in this church, to have a accountability partner. But let's look exactly of what Paul or what Matthew is speaking right here. Uh, with Jesus as he's talking about what correction looks like. It should be private, first of all. It's what he tells us in that first verse there. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Right? It's something that, that does not happen. It's the reason why that people don't like to confess anything in church because then everybody knows it and everybody tells somebody else somebody else's business. When we should not be talking about anybody else's business, we should be loving them. We should be helping them. We should be praying for them, especially if it has nothing to do with us. But instead, we like to get on our old holy horse, right? And we want to ride through town proclaiming everything. We can't wait to share what someone else has done. I can't believe that he did this or she said that. Matthew 7 tells us, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Church, we've got to examine our own hearts first before going to someone else. Please understand that. Please know that, right? This is what Galatians 6 says, to keep watch over your own life and the temptations you face. We must do this humbly, gently, biblically, right? And only when there's actual biblical sin in someone's life. Now, I know I'm getting ready to mess up a whole bunch, right? Because this is where we usually run off the rails. It's not just when we don't like what someone else is doing. But when there's actual sin in that person's life. We're to do this quietly. Right? We're not to talk to everybody else, and we definitely don't want to use the church answer and saying the only reason why I'm telling you this is so you can pray for brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. I know nobody else uses that one. We need to be as quiet as we possibly can. Right? We need to go to that person in private. We've got to say, out of the love that I have for you, I'm so concerned about you and what's going on in your life and the sin that I see taking place. And guess what? The only way that you can do that is if you have a relationship with that person to start with. Right? That means that you've got to invest in one another. You can't run out these doors as quickly as you possibly can and never share life with anybody else here. When we have a brother or sister that has sinned against us or that is caught in sin, not turning from that sin in some way, then we need to love him or her enough, right, not to sit back and just watch them sink their life. Right, to watch them wander off further and further, to go deeper and deeper in sin. How loving is that? Would you do that with your own children or grandchildren? I believe not. I believe that you would do everything in your power, everything that's in your hands to help pull them away from that. 
We don't need to talk to everybody else in the church about what's going on to, to love that person. We need to do this privately with correction, right? The goal is, and what Jesus says, is to win this person over, right? Go in the spirit of love, right? Go in humility and grace. See that, uh, so when this person sees their sin, right, that they'll want to come back, not only into fellowship with us, right, but to be back in right standing with God by his grace. That's what we want to see happen every week that they will and we will communion together with Christ so much deeper, so much better, right? This is a good thing, not trying to sweep it under the rug or shout it from the mountaintops, right? The reason why we need to see this private correction is so very important at the beginning because guess what? You may not have all the information. Oh, boy. How many times do we shoot off our mouth before we know what's really going on? Come on, nobody else has done that. It's so very easy for us, right? It's so very easy for us to already know exactly what's taking place just because we've heard, we've seen a little snippet that we've, we've come to this accusation, uh, 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 we've come to this place, right, where we are already ready to accuse this person of something that maybe they have not even done. We need to realize, we need to gather the facts, right? Maybe we've misread something, right? How easy is that in, in the world that we live in with technology, especially through the ways of texting? Someone will send a text and it will say something and we'll read it and fly a plumb off the handle and that's not at all what the person actually meant. We read something into words. Right? We, we, we took in consideration of maybe what they were thinking, and that was not at all what they were thinking. Last thing that we want to do is talk with others about someone else without going to that person first. Church, this is huge. This is something that we need to do. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, right, of having someone to come and say, hey, I heard you said this, I've heard you done that, I heard that this is part of your life, and the reality is that you didn't do that or you didn't say that. The problem comes is when that person's already told 10 other people of what you supposedly said or did. And then there's a big old mess that's got to be cleaned up because you can't change what somebody thinks happened even if it didn't really happen if you don't believe me look at tons of people's lives right now that are devastated because of only a few seconds only a only a word only a clip that was taken completely out of context Jesus says go to your brother go to your sister just the two of you church this is where 95 percent of restoration happens especially according to discipline in this context of daily ongoing relationships let us do this first but how about what if this doesn't work Let's do small group clarification right if we look back at verses 16 and 17 he says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you uh, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. All right, now there's going to be some situations when the person you go to doesn't listen, I assure you. It happens more than we want it to, that they're not going to receive loving and gentle biblical correction according to their lives, and they won't turn from sin. And if that's the case, then Jesus says, don't stop there, right? Let's go to the next step. Let's make sure that we take this small group. And Jesus is actually quoting from back in Deuteronomy, which we read not too long ago, right, where that we should have other witnesses involved in determining the truth about something to make sure that that everybody's on the same page right the the picture is so very clear here in this moment right that we need to involve another believer or maybe two small setting right this circle of people stay small right these group of people need to be someone who's gentle Someone who's loving and kind and humble, right? Who will go with you to talk to this person about what seems like unrepented sin in their life. 
And the point here is, right, just to kind of broaden this circle just a little bit, right, with one or two other believers so that they are showing the same love, the same concern that you have just, just showed to that person who's caught in sin. And the, the goal is not to, to circle around them like you're ready to kill for a, a lion surrounding its prey, right? We don't want to gang up on somebody. We don't try to, we definitely don't want to try to find people who have built a, ga- a case against this person, right? Which is what we usually do. We start putting out our feelers to find out who doesn't like so-and-so because maybe they've hurt us as well. And we need to bring them alongside with us. We, we need to grab people who will have the characteristics of Christ. Maybe these people listen to what you explain, and as they come alongside of you, they say, you're misreading this entire situation. It's not sin. You don't need to be addressing this situation in this person's life, or maybe they'll just come right out and say, you're exactly right. You've seen that. This is sin, and they will join in helping you as you are concerned about that person. We just have to involve a couple of people, right? And this doesn't have to mean that you've got to call me or some church leader, right? Although it can be, right? If you think that that's necessary, but it's best to involve someone inside of the church who knows this brother or sister and that truly cares about them. And it takes, it takes such love in this situation. If we were to do this, then guess what? Probably 99% of all problems, according to church discipline, would be solved. 99%. This is a great stat. I want to encourage you, right, just as God's word has encouraged me, right, with a great small group of people come to you If they do this, if they say, hey, we see sin in your life in this way, or we see disobedience to God that we're concerned about, then I want to encourage you to listen. And I know that's hard. I know it's so very hard, right? I need to listen to that. If you're coming to me, I want you praying that I will heed that correction, that I will listen. But church, it doesn't stop there because there are people then that still don't get it, right? It goes on to say we need church guidance, right? Then then Jesus says, if a brother or sister refuses to listen even then, then tell it to the church. And boy, this is where we all start getting really uncomfortable. This is where we, we really start saying, okay, preacher, enough's enough. You've made your point. We need to see right here that Jesus is using this word right here in Matthew that we've been talking about church, right? This gathering of believers, the church. This is where that circle expands. This is where we really branch out to this local body, which brings up a hundred different questions. What in the world would that look like? And I can tell you it's an overwhelming process. This is where I'm still praying, right? This is where that I I really, really am depending upon God of what that would look like here at our church, right? And I want to work with our leadership, with those who are on staff, right? I want to make sure in the days to come that what we do, that we do this well, that God forbid that it ever comes to this, right? That that first that we would we would take these biblical steps before we get here. That step one and step two have been taken. And then we come together and say, hey, this is someone that we're concerned about and that l- we as leadership, we want to work with you the best way that we possibly can to help you. And I know. I know, I know, even as I'm already saying this, right, we're already beginning to think that is way too far, (laughs) right? We're already saying, wait a minute, this is, uh, I would leave here. I know, I know, even as, as we preach God's word, this is the reason why people walk away from the faith, because these things are hard. It is tough without God. Without his help, without the Holy Spirit helping us every step of the way. Doesn't this seem a bit much? Are we serious? Should we really do that, especially in the world? And we really need to see that we don't have any other option. 
according to God's word. This is what Jesus commanded us to do. So we don't want to pick and choose which part of his words that we follow or we don't follow because it seems what's comfortable to us. We're followers of Christ. Little Christ, Christ-like. That means we must do what he says. And if we don't follow what, we, what he says, then guess what? We are sinners. And sin separates us from God. We would be walking in disobedience to God. Jesus has told us to do this, and he's told us for a reason. The goal of every act of discipline is what? To restore us to God. When we discipline our children, we want to correct that habit. We don't want to see them continue in what they've just done. We want to help our brothers and sisters, ourselves, get back to Christ. And I've asked you, right, and I've seen this over and over. And I don't know, right, I don't know what this part looks like. And I've been a part of this, and it is hard. But you need to see that this is an entire group of people that love this individual enough to say, we want you to be made right with God. And we're here for you. We love you. We want you to come back to Christ. Listen to the sound of Christ's words. Listen to the plea of my heart that God loves you and I so much, right? That if in you're in unrepented sin this morning, right? Running away from God will do one thing. It will destroy your life. It will destroy your family. It will destroy the people that are around you. And guess what? Even more, he will send his entire body. I hope that the people of Bethlehem would not hold back that the entire church would chase after someone to bring them back from the air of their ways that's the type of love that God has for you that's what he done when he scaled and done everything that he done he went to the pits of hell to pull you out of that muck and mire he cared enough about you not to leave you where you're at he loves you that much and I want you to know that I love you that much and we've got to see love, God's love. This is the issue this morning. But even more, it says that, it, guess what? It doesn't stop there. There's church exclusion. Jesus then says, even when the whole church is calling this person back and then they still refuse to listen, then step four is church exclusion. Oh, my gosh. And we're living in a world where inclusion, right, inclusive, all of these things where everything is wanting to be. And here we're talking about excluding someone. This is Jesus' words, right? He says, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Do you know how much tax collectors were hated back during this time by Jewish people, right? And hate is a strong word. But they were taken advantage of, right? Especially even Gentiles that were, that were separated from God's people, right? This imagery is so strong is to basically say to treat this person like they're no longer your brother and sister in Christ. And I, I know, I, I know as we hear these words, it's overwhelming to us, right? Just as we saw this sermon and we heard that, right, on, on church membership, right? The Bible really doesn't, doesn't know anything about a Christian who's not identified as part of the body. And that's what you have to see, that being a part of this local body in biblical times was everything. And if you weren't a part of that, you were nothing. So, be, so to be excluded from that? Not to be a part of it, not to be a member, not to be part of the body of Christ. It's overwhelming. We're, we don't, we don't want to ever get to this point. It's the reason why there's so much groundwork before that. This is tough. It's really tough. This whole process is overwhelming, but God has given us these commands. And it's tough to even understand of what that would look like in a modern-day modern day circumstance. The church kicking someone out. I thought the church was supposed to be a place that welcomed everybody. Just, just to, for us to say, wait a minute, no, you're, you're not a member of this church. This seems to go against everything that we think, doesn't it? But this is exactly of what Jesus is commanding his followers to do. Go with me really quick, right? Stay with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
I know that we've we've looked at part of this, especially uh, in church membership, right? The church of Corinth. There was so much that's going on. They're actually living very loosely just to be very, very modest, right? There's a lot of sexual immorality, a culture that was completely against God. But newsflash, it's very similar to what we're living in today. And immorality had just taken over the church. And Paul, right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he's addressing it in such a forceful way, in a way that really should leap off the page at us, especially when he addresses an individual that's doing this immorality with his stepmothers, right? And I want you to, I want you to see this. We're going to read quite a bit. Just hang tight so we get the whole context. Starting verse 1, chapter 5, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit as if present. I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is no good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sanctified. Boy, we're going to come back there. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral people and not at all meaning the sexual immoral of this world or the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of his brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those, it is not those inside the church whom you are to judge. Oh my gracious. There's so much inside of that, right? There's so much for us to grab a hold here of what Paul is saying. He brings us to one simple question. Why? Why is church discipline and accountability so important? It's for the good of each person. It's for the good of us as believers in Christ, right? This is so very important. This something so well overwhelming. It's for the salvation of this individual. And I know that we've mentioned it early, right? To move someone from the church would be an overwhelming thing, right? But this would bear witness for them to basically be giving evidence that they're not a follower of Christ. You see, and we've, we've been taught for so many years that we can live like hell and actually be a follower of Christ, and we cannot. The Bible is very clear according to its word that we cannot continue in habitual sin and be a believer in Christ. But yet, for some reason, we've taken the bait from the enemy to say, well, I prayed a prayer. Big deal. So did the demons in hell. They believe, they know who Christ is. It's the reason why that they're fighting to take you with them. They know what he's capable of. It's the reason why this language is so very strong here. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That's verse 5. That's the reason why it's for the good of that person. And I know there's so much debating and there's so much that we could talk about with this verse, right? And I don't have time to unpack of what it means, right, for the flesh to be destroyed. And uh, there's so many issues that we could unplug and unpack with this. But I am, I am convinced, I am, I am so much satisfied with God's word uh, to the point that I believe it's very, very clear that as a church, it, we need to do all that we possibly can to help this this man, woman, boy, or girl to be saved for the day of the Lord. We need to go after them to try to pull them from that, right? That when judgment day comes, we want them to be able to hear the words, well done, not depart from me. 
This is what we're called to do. And I, I know, right, if someone is walking in unrepentant sin again and again and again, not just battling sin like we do on, on a daily basis, right, but deliberately choosing sin, right, not wanting to repent of it. And I know that's hard sometimes for us to believe and hear that, but there are people who claim to be Christians that are doing this now. We need to realize that according to God's word, they cannot be. If you're not repenting, if you're not following Christ, then it's quite simply, right, we need to hear that they are lost. And we need to address them. We're not talking about lost people out in our community. We're talking about people who say they're followers of Christ. When we live in this culture today, right, when someone is excluded or someone is kicked out or moved away, right, we think, well, that's no big deal. There's a hundred other churches right here in Morris County, and they'll just go down the road. But, man, that's such, a, that's such a caveat, right? We need to realize that in this world that we're living in, that that's not the answer, that we can just hop around from church to church so that we can continue to live like we want to and be disobedient to God. It is a big deal. Sin is serious. Hear that, right? We're not just playing a game. Think of it more along the lines with Russian roulette. Instead of only having one bullet, there's all bullets but one. That's serious. We're not willing to spin the chamber with those type odds. It is a big deal. And so far, we're looking at things according to what God says, not what Kyle Yankee says. And this must change. We must change our thought process. We must understand, especially in the world around us. I'm not talking about going to your workplace tomorrow and talking to every lost people about what's wrong in their life. I'm talking about looking to someone beside you. Oh, my gracious. Wait a minute, Pastor. We won't keep very many people that way. It's okay. I don't think that we have to look around, and I don't think that that's the, 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 the part of this exercise that I want you to see. We need to understand how serious this is. First John says that we've looked at this verse, right? That if someone walks away is not really ready to deal with their sin, then maybe they were never born again to start with. And it'll become clear. I'm not saying these words. Church discipline is ultimately to help people get back. Because if we believe what it says right back there in chapter 5, right? Grab a hold of that of, of Christ. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. If we believe that, if what we're going to celebrate here in a few weeks is true, if Christ was the perfect one, if he had no sin and took my sin and nailed it upon that cross, then he did so so that we too could walk in the newness of life so that we no longer would live according to our old ways. That he sacrificed because he had no sin. He had no clue of what it looked like. This is the gospel, church. This is the message that we're proclaiming outside these walls. And if you're not a follower of Christ today, hear my words, right? Please listen to me from the standpoint of knowing that there's no hate in what I'm saying. You are welcomed to attend this church, and we want you here. We want you here every week. We want you to explore what we're talking about. We want you to dive into God's Word. We want you to find out for, you, for yourself. We want you to see the love of Christ we want you to see that the difference is we're not going to call you a member if you're not, and especially if you're not a follower of Christ. But I don't think that you would expect that. I don't think that you would want that right if you're not. Instead, we're going to encourage you. We're going to urge you to repent of your sin as quickly as you possibly can and follow Christ. This is what we believe. This is what we stand on. This is the message that changes everything. This is what we want to communicate to anybody who is away from God. Repent of your sin. I want to say that over and over and over, week in and week out. Your sin, it's separating. Listen to me, it separates me. And if you die in your sin, you're going to be separated from God for all of eternity. God's made a way. 
He's made a way for you to be forgiven. He's died on that cross, right? He's sacrificed his, his, his son, right, to be the substitute for you. He's risen from the dead, which we're going to be shouting from the rooftop in a few weeks, but we shouldn't be waiting to April 8th. We ought to be doing that today that he's risen from the dead and that any person that trusts in him and trusts in him as Savior and Lord, they will be forgiven of all their sins, every single one of them. And at that moment, guess what? You're born again. You're blood-bought. You're wrote in the Lamb's book of life. If you surrender, you'll be restored to God. This is the gospel. And I want to urge you, I want to encourage you, believe in Jesus today. Don't get used to hearing those words. Let them be fresh. Let them be new. Let it be as good as it's a boy or it's a girl. Have joy in your heart today. This is the message. Anyone who's away from God, when someone that does not know him, this message is saying we love you. Why? Because it's for the good of the church. And the purity of the church is so very important. And I know, I know we've already went a long way this morning, right? And I know that there's so much that we're saying here. But notice how Paul never actually addresses the, the person here that's committed this sin. Right? It's, as he's writing this, he never even mentioned their name. Because, see, he'd already known that they'd already done the back door. That they'd already talked and they'd already met. And now he's picking at the church. He's saying, hey, why is something not being done at that? Why are you all not addressing it? There's someone that's living in unrepented sin. Paul is saying you're standing by. He's not, he's not mad because of the sin, right? He's, stand, he's mad because the church is standing by and not doing anything about it. I don't want you to, to miss that, right? God is holding the church accountable for someone else. Oh, my gracious, how much will we stand accountable to God for? This is an overwhelming thought. It's an overwhelming thought for me as your, as your pastor. I want you to hear that statement this morning, Bethlehem. God is telling us right now that he holds us accountable. He holds us accountable, all of us together in this church. We're accountable to God. We're accountable to one another, especially when we leave unrepented sin in the church unaddressed. So many times we think it's so much better to sweep it under the rug. It'll work itself out. Church, listen to me. It's not, it's not the word of Kyle Yankee this morning. This is the word of God. We do not think like this. We think more on the lines of individual when it comes to sin, and that's a personal problem, right? That's, that's their business. That's something that, that they need to deal with, but that's not true, right? Go back to the book of Joshua with Achan and look at the entire family. His, his entire family was wiped out because of his sin. This is our issue. We belong to one another right we belong to one another it's all of our concern and if someone continues along these ways it doesn't just affect them it affects our entire church it affects all of us before god it it affects the way that we worship here that's why that he talks about that leavened bread and he says how much of it ruins the whole whole loaf right every single bit right just that little more just that little speck of it if we continue to see this take place, we will become responsible to God. Have you ever thought about church like that? I know that it's hard for us to. We should be filled with grief. We should be filled with all, right? We should be sorrowful over our sins, not just sorry that we got caught, but truly confessing those, right? It's what's made this revivals that have been taking place. It's what will market a true revival if those people who have confessed their sins have repented from them if they are still living in those ways right now. I know that it's not the way that we normally think, right? And I know that this makes us look very close-minded and it makes us think, oh my gracious, I don't know if I want to continue to attend a place like this. We must see that the glory of Christ is worth much more than just our hurt ego or our hurt pride. God says it's actually prideful for us to ignore what's taking place like it's no big deal. He says that you're arrogant is what he just said in this scripture. We need to be a church that executes church discipline. 
so that so that the church will stay pure, so that the person will stay pure, but more importantly, for the glory of God. That's exactly what took place in all of the Old Testament. It's the reason why that God was so strict in his judgment. It's the reason why when people sinned, he just killed them. Because the, he is holy, and the only way that they could be different was is that they could not have sin in their life. I know, right? We're living in a sin-filled world. And I believe that the world that we're living in is not much different than what was taking place 2,000 years ago in Corinth, right? I think that there is an epidemic problem right here in the church today. That there are all kinds of accusations of men and women of God that live like the world and they continue to be supported by the church. We're expected to treat it seriously. We're expected to, 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 to grab a hold of this and to confront it. We cannot tolerate sin. This is important to Jesus and I want you to know it's, it's important to me. And I know that we're not going to be a perfect church. And I know that no one in here is going to be perfect at this side of all of eternity. But God is calling his church today to lovingly pursue holiness for us to truly go after it, right? There's no other option for us, right? I want and I believe that God wants, right, that, that he needs to be glorified all across Washington County. And he's wanting to do that right through this group of believers right here in Bethlehem. The church is designed to display God's glory and his character. And the only way that we can do that is if we look like him. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, it, we will not display this character, right? We will not display his glory when a certain group of people or a certain number of people are coming. That's not our intent to, to, to just have this set to where that we say, praise the Lord, something must be going right because attendance is up. We don't need to measure success like that, right? The number of people who come here every week is not a marker of how God is working here. Now, please don't take that the wrong way, right? I appreciate every one of you being here. And yes, we want more and more and more, but that is not the marker that God has set. We should be coming more and more like Jesus is how that we measure what's taking place here. How that we look like Christ, how that we act like him. If we're doing that, mark it up. It's a success. We're accountable to God for everything that we say and do. And he's wanting to help us recognize that, to help us love one another, and to humbly share with one another when things aren't right. Not only for the holiness of our lives, but for the holiness of others. We need a church that will love us enough to lead us away from sin and towards Jesus. And I know that's an overwhelming statement. And I know, guess what? This ain't going to add more to wh what we think today. Here's what, what I do know. I do know if we truly want to see God continue to work in and through our church, then we have to be accountable to him. And we have to be accountable to one another. And we have to allow him to discipline us. And therefore, we have to discipline one another. And church, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like in the days ahead, right? But I'm praying that God will continue to lead us every step of the way to be a biblical church. And I just pray right now in these moments, God, I know as we hear these words, especially in the world that we're living in that is telling us the exact opposite. That ought to be, that ought to be proof enough right there that what we're hearing and seeing across our, our news feeds and what we're seeing that is, is inciting so many people across the globe Because, God, you have designed us to be holy. 
and that you will stop at nothing to get us to that point. So Lord, I, I pray for every single person here today, for those that are watching or those that will watch later as well, that right now inside of our hearts, that if there, there are things in our lives that we need to get rid of, that we would just make things right with you today, that we wouldn't waste any time in these moments, that we would realize the seriousness of our sin, that it's affecting much more than just our lives especially for those that have never trusted in you, that have never made a decision to follow you. I know what an overwhelming thought that that might, must be to hear today of the expectations that God is calling. But knowing that God loves you enough that he doesn't want to keep you where you're at, that he wants to grow you into a mighty man or a mighty woman of God. And the only way that is is to rid yourself of this world and the sin that, that is so easily tangling you. And this morning, there's an opportunity for you to respond. And there are people across this room that would love to do that very thing, that would love to come alongside and pray specifically for you and with you. the Lord right here in this moment maybe you're you're really struggling on what this looks like as, as part of your own life I just pray that you take this opportunity and asking God to show you to show you what this looks like in your own life right here in these moments right listen and respond to the voice of God know that God truly loves you enough not to not to leave you where you're at that this place can truly be a place where we move you into a right standing with God we ask all this in Jesus name amen church stand